Welcome to the Strati Cast. In episode 178, we are going to reflect on Manchester United's much needed win at Fulham, despite another uninspiring performance. Then it's time to preview Copenhagen away, Rashford tackling the spread of misinformation, team confidence, and your questions. Brian, how are you? I heard you had a bit of a nightmare trip to London the weekend. We'll get on to the game shortly, but tell us about the delay in getting to Craven Cottage on Saturday. Jesus, typical me. Um, don't know why, but for the whole week leading up to the to the game, I was convinced I was flying to Gatwick. I have no idea why this got into my head, but absolutely convinced I was going to Gatwick. Sat down the night before, jumped on train line app, booked my train from Gatwick to Putney. 40 minutes, I was like, yeah, loads of time here. This is great. Organised to meet a few lads for a pint before the game and whatnot. I'm in the airport, in Shannon Airport that morning, sitting down having breakfast. And I'm chatting to two other lads. Uh, they're flying to Heathrow. They, they keep asking me, like, oh, you're flying to Gatwick? Yeah, what time's your flight home? We're chatting away, chatting away. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like get the Gatwick flight at 10 to, 10 to 9 tonight. And they were like, are you sure there's a, there's a Gatwick flight at that time? And the lad who's flying with me, Alan, Alan Murphy, who also, might I add, booked his train from Gatwick to Putney, turns around and goes, no, we're flying to Stansted. I was like, we can't be flying to Stansted. You booked the train the same as I did. I'm sure I only booked with what you sent me on. Next thing, looked at the boarding cards because he checked us in. At, for, I didn't have this flight booked myself. Looked at it, realized it was Stansted, went all oh, bollocks, jumped onto the train app, started checking out times and went, oh, massive bollocks. This is tight. Uh, if we get too much delayed here, we're in trouble. And I had to collect my ticket because the ticket didn't arrive in the post due to the usual Irish customs post-Brexit bullshit, which is another topic for another podcast, but this customs crack is causing some hassle with tickets delivered in Ireland. Um, actually, today, the customs the customs docket arrived today, which I was supposed to get last week to pay to get my Fulham away ticket delivered. Like, it's nonsense. But um, yeah, it was tight. So we're, we're queuing up for the flight. Flight's obviously not taken off in time. We're on the plane. Flight's definitely not taking off on time. The trains I'm looking at to get to Putney, we're missing the first one, we're missing the second one. We finally get the third one, which is a lot later than I hope to be there. And we got like the ticket collection point about, it was a half 12 kickoff, got there about 10 past quarter past 12. So I rushed, on to, rushed into the ground and smashed the first point I could see, which was absolutely horrific. It was some fucking Hell's Kitchen or Hell's Angel shite or something, some IPA bullshit. Um, smashed one of them into me quickly and into the ground. Yeah, it was all hustle and bustle for you from the very start. Did you even get to even enjoy a few drinks beforehand? It sounded like get to swallow them into you. No, literally just, it was planes, trains, and automobiles trying to get to the ground as fast as possible to make sure we make kick off. And a train into Tottenham Hale, a fucking tube to Vauxhall, and another train out to Putney. So it was just rushed. What was, it was... What was the away end like? It sounded great on TV. It was funny, Dale, because... Do you know, like after coming off the back of two three 0 defeats at OT, which is fairly demoralising, and I like there's some stat that it's the first time we've been beaten. I don't know three 0 at home twice in a row in fucking donkey's years, but like everybody after the Newcastle game, like after the City game, we were pissed off. After the Newcastle game, you were just fucking downbeat and depressed. I'd be openly honest. Going to the game, I thought that I thought the away end could have been bordering line on toxic or at least a bit kind of subdued due to the due to the recent goings on and sort of like all the pressure surrounding Tin Hag and his job and whatnot. To be fair, I was pleasantly surprised it was pretty upbeat. Um anyone I was talking to like, heading into the ground or on the concourse or on the way into the ground, everyone was kind of just our normal selves and I suppose just hoping fucking hoping we get a performance out of them and hoping things went well. No, to be fair, the away end was decent during most of the game, as usual, we scored and it got chalked off by VAR, which is a kick in the bollocks again. And that kind of sucks the life out of any away end or any any home in any game at all. Any match going fan gets an awful kick in the teeth when that happens, but it was a bit sickening. Um, the away end was still pretty decent, but as the game went on, and I suppose frustration mounted at the performance on the field and the lack of a goal, and like Fulham were shit, let's be honest, like Fulham were fucking terrible. And we're lucky they're terrible because if they weren't, they'd have beat us because we weren't at the races, really, to be fair, uh, for large periods of that game. But I was sitting down outside after the game, funnily enough, with um, with Duncan, Duncan Drasdow, having a chat with him. 
inside in the bar and he made a great point and he I actually didn't think about it until he said it to me afterwards about 15 minutes to work before the end that's when the away end really really got going like it just came to life it fucking it really erupted and it coincided with the team really pushing like you could maybe say it's coincidence like Pellistry coming on for Anthony and whatnot but and Garnacho made a bollocks of that back heel pass shortly before that and I think he might have just maybe realised I need to pull the finger out of my ass here that's, that's silly like them two boys caught fire. The team started playing better. The away end was fucking electric. And it, you could be forgiven for saying that it might have been the away end that pushed him on and got him over the line and got him going. And, and I think it's a fair comment. So the team started playing a bit better and grabbed the away. That, that, that last minute goal, Bruno's goal, absolute pandemonium. Fucking, like I hate the term limbs. It's a cringy kind of an internet term. But if there was one, you could say it was limbs. That was it because I went fucking flying. Absolutely. How many rows? I think four. And I'm not the kind of person that goes flying through rows. Like I try, I don't do that, but I didn't really have a choice. I just got fucking lamped from behind. I took out some fella in front of me, an older gentleman, absolutely fucking wiped him. One of the lads ended up coming out over my back getting pushed. I think he stood in his back at some stage. Your man turned around and he was looking at me with daggers and he was fucking rightly getting sour. I just looked, I was like, I'm sorry, like, but literally not my fault. Didn't and next thing as I was trying to explain myself, got fucking launched forward again. And went past him, so it was a, it was a, it was a beaut. I mean, it's an absolute beaut. Last minute winner or late minute, late on winner, absolutely fantastic. Worth worth the effort, worth getting up in the middle of the night and worth that fucking hassle getting there. And all the hustle and bustle, I suppose. But look, should the performance, as you kind of briefly touched on, it, it was very very flat. Um, didn't really get going till the end in a stoppage time winner. Thankfully, we're talking about a win on this podcast because we were kind of dreading doing the last one. It turned out to be. We got good feedback from it, but we were dreading um, the idea of going into the podcast after two heavy defeats. And the performance this time around wasn't great, nothing to get too excited about. So Tyg is asked in a, a pretty valid question. Does the result paper over cracks, or is it a sign of progress, even if it's minimum? It's kind of a two-edged knife, this one. Yes, obviously it does paper over cracks. I mean, we've been fucking terrible all season, and there's no doubt about that. And we were terrible for large periods or the most of that game. Does the paper over cracks, I suppose, run your remains to be seen by what comes next and what, what can we can build on after this? But at the same time, one of the things I will say, the fact that they did keep going to the end and the fact that they kept fighting and they did get that late goal is a good sign for me because of late and a lot of this season, they've been very fucking, very lacking in that that bit of aggression to keep going, to like keep fighting, try get going and try get that late goal and try grab it, just try keep fucking pushing until you get it. And we haven't seen a lot of that this season. So to see that in Craven Cottage was, it was a great positive for me because we've doubted, we've doubted if the players are playing for Tin Hag, which is trying to second guess what's going on in the dressing room. And we've been kind of saying and speculating and everyone's really been suggesting that maybe he's lost the dressing room a bit and some of the players aren't really working for him and whatnot. But, and we've been asking for effort and desire. I mean, if they keep going to the fucking very end and they do manage to eke out that win and get get that late goal, and you can see what it meant to them, like you can see how they celebrated the whole lot of them. It's it's endearing to me to see that they did stay going to the very end and they didn't just say, look, fuck, we're after, not after playing well and it's not going to be our day and we're just going to just take the draw and move on. But they kept going, they kept fighting and they got the late goal. So I'll take it as a positive and I'll try, I'll try look at it positively, positively for now. Ten Hag touched on it in the lead up to this game when he was questioned about the players' attitude that they did do this against um, Brentford as well with McTominay's two stoppage time goals. So I think it's, it is a valid point that these players... I don't think they're thrown in the towel, but it's something that even Rooney mentioned when he was asked about it, that I do believe there's certain players that could put in more or that we could demand a lot more from. Um, there's, there's factors, there's factors to play, there's injuries as well that we've mentioned in probably every episode this season because it's a big factor. But the performances, again, they could be much better. They could be much better. Like you're mentioning the last 15 minutes, I mentioned the end of the game against Brentford. We're only really seeing phases, if anything. Now, I suppose the weekend after the start we've had, 
we were probably delighted to get out of Craven Cottage regardless of performance and just have the three points because we really needed, especially we'll be talking soon about Copenhagen and needing that bit of a confidence boost going into that game because you briefly touched on your feelings prior to kickoff and how you thought it'd be like really, really negative. Can you imagine going to Copenhagen after dropping points again at the weekend? So I think it definitely does give us a bit of help in that regard. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, it would almost be unthinkable to be going into Copenhagen, which realistically, if we lose it, we're yeah. out of the Champions League progression into, into the knockouts. Like if we'd have lost against Fulham off the back of them two defeats, it would have been fucking horrific. So it was a vital win. And it was one of those ones, just get three points by any means, by any means possible and get out of there. But you know, as much as we say that, and as much as we're grateful for getting the three points, which is almost terrible to be saying, we're grateful to get three points against Fulham. But you still want to see a fucking lift in performance. And it wasn't there, do you know? It was poor. I mean, a couple of players on that side again, you're looking at them going, oh, Jesus fucking Christ. Like, like, I hate, I don't I won't say I hate, but I don't like singling one player out of the whole side. Like, But mm-hmm. I think he needs to be singled out for this one. Like, Anthony was fucking diabolical. He was absolutely horrific. I mean, Pellistry didn't exactly pull up trees when he came on, but like he showed the bare minimum effort, pressing, tackling, like he still got stuck in. If he lost the ball, he was fucking hammering in trying to get it back. Probably not the most skillful and talented player in the world, to be fair, but at least he showed a bit of desire and he showed a bit of fucking in a bit of in product. I mean, fucking Anthony, like I just I'm finding it very hard to watch him. Like I'm finding it very hard to watch that fella try to play football because there was a stage on Saturday, like you're you're begging for him to beat the man. Like he gets the ball, all you want to see him is beat the man. Whether it's his style of football or not, I don't care. Like Talk about the United way of football and the United way of playing. We're used to wingers playing for United. They get the ball, beat the man, whip in across. He actually did beat his man at one stage. Like he did his little fucking spinny, leggy fucking trick thing. He beat the man. And literally, as he beat him in the same footstep, he cut back again past him, like back and left him back on side or on the wrong side again. And you're looking at him going, You've just beat the man. What the fuck are you cutting back for? Like it's frustrating to watch. It really is frustrating to watch him. Um it's, it's hard because you're looking at Rasmus Hoyland in the middle, like we're after investing a lot of money in a, a lovely young striker who plays a certain type of football. Now, again, he's not the type of footballer. If you look back at him before he joined us and try to analyse what type of player he is, he's not really, even though he's a, he's a big, sized, aggressive young lad, he's not the kind of player that you're pumping balls at him. He, lo- he likes to play in behind lines. He likes to get a ball into feet and play past the defence and let him go on to it. He must be literally going, the fuck am I supposed to do here? Like, I'm not getting any service from the right hand side at all. None, none on the right hand like, side. Non existent. Left hand side, a bit, but nothing fucking great. And scraps. again, like, scraps. And you're missing, like, you're missing Luke Shaw. Luke Shaw, as much as Luke Shaw has been brilliant and inconsistent and, and terrible and brilliant, you're missing Luke Shaw something unreal on the left hand side. Because when Luke Shaw is on the side, on the left hand side, he's offering an overlap. He's offering a decent cross. He's aggressive going forward and he's positive thinking. He likes to burst in and he likes to cut balls across the box. He's a big loss. Whether you like Luke Shaw or not, he's a massive loss to that left-hand side. Like, you're, you're dealing with Reggie on Dallo. We had fucking Victor Lindelof at left-back at one stage. I mean, you can't be expecting Rasmus Island to be getting good service when your left-back is Victor Lindelof. And, like, Rashford's off form. And Garnacho, I, like, I love Garnacho, as you know. I, like, I, I've jokingly said I'd name my next child Alejandro more often than not. But, like, Rash, or Garnacho is also a young lad who has a failing at the moment in his play where he gets the ball, the head goes down and he just fucking takes, he takes off. Like his vision sometimes isn't great. He's not really looking. That's not a slight in him. It's obviously going to come with age, like maturity and, and developing. But at the moment, his first instinct, which I love is get the ball and fucking go at him. But he still needs to get, once he gets at him and goes past him, get the head up, take a look and pick a pass. And he's lacking that sometimes. So Highland is really, really, really feeding off of fucking nothing. So that's, I mean, People can when, say well, yeah, when people mention his stats, I think that's that is the main thing. He nailed it that he's only getting scraps on that left hand side. The service is completely non existent on, on the right hand side. But when you mention Luke Shaw, and people will mention his overlapping, which will help the likes of Marcus Rashford out on the left. I think with Luke Shaw, why he's su- such a valuable asset to United and this team, and why we're missing him so much. Unlike a lot of the players in this team, when we go forward, he's not predictable. He can carry the ball to the halfway line. And he can make a very, very good forward pass from those positions. He can also go on the overlap. 
So that the likes of the service, he can also go on those runs himself towards the box, and yeah. you know anything can happen. He, he the teams, the opposition, sorry, don't know what's coming with him. I think that's what we're really missing. Rashford's missing him. Highland with the service that he would get from him is absolutely missing him. And defensively, I think we're really missing him because when you play regular <laughs> defensively, he's not very good. He's not very good. To, and I, 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 this isn't a surprise. I don't think it's a surprise to anyone. We signed him on loan. Wasn't getting the games for Spurs for, what, two or so years. No. No one was expecting this guy to be a world beater by any means. But we do desperately miss Shaw. And I think Martinez as well is another big miss. Um, before the game, Brian Rashford was ruled out due to injury. But infamous fan channel, the United Stand are telling their viewers that there's reason to believe Ten Hag is lying. Um, big claim. Do you think Rashford was right to set the record straight by the, dismissing their malicious claims? Absolutely. And I would love, I'd absolutely love to see more footballers at United take exception to the bullshit that comes out of this, we'll call it loosely term media channels or whatever you want to call them, these fan cam, fan channels. <sighs> you know, look... I've long enough been beating the drum of my dislike towards him and I've written numerous articles about it. I've got into it with numerous uh, fan cam content creators or whatever you want to call them. Um, to be fair, Matt Goldbridge once contacted you because I was, because I write frustrated news. He had a little whinge at you about me. Very bold, Brian. I'm, I'm, I'm a very bold boy. Um, look, it's, it's just how I am. I can't handle the agenda-driven, click-driven bullshit that comes out of this place. Like it's, I've gone after him for years. When I say I've gone after him, I just, I just don't like him. I've passed comment about him on Twitter and whatnot, which has led to most of them blocking me or me blocking them in turn. Um, I'm very outspoken about it. I always have been. I can't stand him. But it's funny because Mark Goldbridge or Brent de Cesar or whatever the fuck he wants to portray himself online as, He's built, like, don't get me wrong, he's a very intelligent cunt. He's a very intelligent man. He's created a fantastically financially viable brand, which has put himself on a platform that has made himself a lot of money, got himself on talk sport, and got himself a massive following. Now, the people that follow him, I dare say, it wouldn't be my type of football fan. But he's done very well for himself. But he's done it off the back of feeding off negativity. No, the last decade at United since Ferguson left, he's had a lot of fucking ammunition. Let's not be let's not be unrealistic. He's a lot of, a lot of work, a lot to work with. We've had a lot of shit performances, poor players, poor signings, and he has thrived off of that. But he builds agendas and he puts the type of people that I personally really don't like into positions where they can portray their opinion or their agendas, which garners clicks. Okay, most of us see through it. it I I despise it. It's a dangerous thing to do, I think, in football where you're turning a fan base against particular players because of your your want to earn money from clicks. But it's funny because he plays his character. And recently the character got called out by Paul Parker, who used to play for United many years ago. Solid mm. defender in himself. And it was a, it was kind of a random one, really. Like Paul Parker isn't like the most outspoken bloke on the planet, and you don't really hear that much from him. But well, it's, sorry, one of the best descriptions of a footballer ever heard. Was Fergus saying he tackles like a ferret? <laughs> like a ferret. <laughs> <laughs> I remember watching Paul Parker when I started following him when I was young. Tenacious little fucker. Yeah, he was a good, he was a good, good, strong fullback. But he went after Goldbridge recently, and he said, um, he came out saying, you know, fucking, he's a Forest fan. He's this, whatever he said about him. He just called him out for being an absolute fraud. And Mark Goldbridge reacted to it, which I thought was quite amusing, by playing the mental health card which I thought was laughable. Mm. It was an interesting one. He, he started crying about mental health and this can affect people and whatnot. Now, let me f preface this by saying, big advocate for mental health here. I 100% support mental health issues and mental health problems and people who suffer with it and whatnot, which is why it fucking annoyed me because he played the card. He didn't actually say, I, I've suffered with mental health issues all my life or blah, blah, blah. I've got anxiety and depression. He just pulled out the little fucking weak cover-up card to try to get a, garner a bit of sympathy and go well paul parker shouldn't really be saying this about me because you know this could affect my mental health and i was sitting there looking at this thing going, of all people you fucking shithouse you absolute shithouse 
What about the mental health of every player that you've gone after or every manager that you've gone after for the last how many years and turned your 2.2 million fucking million mm. supporters against? But yet when someone puts it up you, it's the mental health card. Oh, poor Mark. But then today, one of his dickheads on his channel thing, this fucking Planet Faz fool, the fellow who hangs around... Yeah, this Faz weirdo who has his own name on his hat, by the way, I spotted that earlier, it's a bit weird. He hangs around the ground hours beforehand to see footballers come in to tell people who's in the match day squad, which is borderline fucking weirdo behaviour. He was screaming for Zinedine Zidane instead of Tin Hag and wanted Tin Hag out over the last few days. And they threw up this fucking video saying, Marcus Rashford's future's in doubt. Like, are you for real? He's you see, a, the a, danger a, here, there is a danger. This isn't, and we need to stress this too, the, the platform that they're operating on. And as, as you mentioned, he's a very, very smart man, Mark, and what he's built in the brand. But it's a huge platform. And the stuff that's going out there is being watched by so many people. That's where it's quite powerful. And so many kids there. Like, it's impressionable so young fans who are going to take yeah. this guy. Like, the likes of us can see through the, the smoke screens and the bullshit. Like, they're talking to impressionable young lads who are going to take this as actual news reporting, that this is actually what's happening. Like, it's not what's fucking happening. It's absolute bullshit for the sake of clicks. And the whole reason they want clicks is to make financial gain and monetary gain from it. That's the, the reasoning behind it. it. They wouldn't support Rashford for the sake of argument, or the video spin or the clicks or thumbnails wouldn't be positive in their ideal because it wouldn't garner the same clicks. But when you throw up something like Marcus Rashford's future in doubt, or like... Human nature is gone. Is it? Fuck a bit of click on this. There was some headlines that they use quite similarly in the past few months in regards to Greenwood. Um, and when people didn't know about Greenwood's future, there was like these kind of questions about Greenwood return and and these kind of things to get people to click on it. And <coughs> that's where that's where it crosses the line when it's just complete and utter shite. Um, they did it back back uh, when Ollie when Ollie was in charge. There there was actually like um. Someone put together a montage of the thumbnails they used for videos around all it, yes. around Solskjaer. and it's it's a modus operandi, or it's like it's a little trick they use. They use these extremely misleading, sensationalist thumbnails with sensationalist questions, as in they're for, forming a question like Marcus Rashford's future in doubt is Ole gone? This kind of bullshit kind of a question mm. thing to draw you in to watch their nonsense. Look, I'm not going to beat on about it for tonight because they don't deserve that much attention, but. Every, the ninety five percent of these people that do these fan channel fan cam things are fucking wankers, and it's as simple as that. I can't. There is good that. lads too, like Jay, Jay from Straight, Sheffield Park. Yeah. That straight out Jay Marty, great lad, good lad, good proper United fan goes home, been going home and away. Time time served doesn't cause sensationalist bullshit. To be fair, actually, no, to one cause, of the, it one, it cause it as it is, and to be fair, one like one of the articles I previously put out in Straight News. Jay took exception to it and we had a bit of a tete-a-tete a -tete and over and back, but signs on, we actually became quite friendly afterwards. So, no, Jay's a good lad, but like by and large, there's exceptions to the rule, which he's one of them, but the most of these are absolute fucking dickheads that are in it for, for nothing more than clicks and money. So just, I suppose, as a word of warning to anyone listening, that if you haven't really ex experienced these people already, which I'm sure most of you have, don't give them the attention that they're craving and don't give them don't pay heed to them or take your football opinions from these people because at the end of the day, it's fucking nonsense. Like, stick if you want to get content for football, I'm a massive, I've always been a massive advocate of your of our fanzines. Like, stick to the likes of United We Stand and, and Red News. That's proper content by proper football fans. That's what you want to be listening to or reading. Do you know what I mean? And we're, we're obviously saying this too when we're talking to people listening and young kids that are watching that content, but the other message needs to go to Manchester United Football Club because... They openly give this channel access to, to players, which they did a number of times last season in the lead up to Carabao Cup games. They did it time and time again. Um, they know who they're dealing with. They know the type of content that they create. But why do they feed it? And they must take some responsibility there as well, because if I was Marcus Rashford today and I seen that headline, not only would I have been dismissing it the way he did, but I'll be also going into the club and I'll be asking, hold on, what the fuck is going on? Why would I see these guys yet again around Carrington given access around here? When there's, by the way, some of the, the more respected fan outlets that you named do not get access like that. Um, and that 
that begs a big question for me about the people working at United. But look, hopefully some of these people I'm referring to won't be in a job for much longer if, if, if Radcliffe gets his way. Moving on, we must get back to the game and not give that shower any more publicity. Um, United had the ball in the back of the net after four minutes. It took another four minutes for that fire check to complete. McTominay's goal was not given. It was disallowed controversially. What needs to be done to sort out officiating in the Premier League? Because that goal wasn't allowed because apparently Maguire was in an offside position, but he didn't interfere with play. Which just, I know it's in the in the book of rules that if a player interferes that it, it can't be given, but he doesn't touch the ball. The ball's like, it's just madness, isn't it? We're, we're getting to the stage every week, there's countless decisions that we're debating with VAR. Like, if you... I understand, I dislike vehemently, but I understand the theory of VAR, like to make up for blatantly obvious missed mistakes, like clear and obvious error, which is what we were led to believe and we were promised is what this was going to do. Fair enough. If there's a clear and obvious error, something that's ludicrously bad, I understand it. It has to be found or whatever, but it's become so scientific, like it's become so meticulously scientific to the letter of millimeters that it's just destroyed. It's destroying football. It's... The offside, I, don't, I have no idea what is offside anymore. I have no idea what's interfering with play. I have absolutely no idea what constitutes as handball anymore. It's just become fucking laughable. What it's really doing, and I was actually talking over and back on this a while ago on Twitter, like an hour ago, it's killing it for a match going fan. Like people in the ground of every club, like this isn't United related or, or me with my United hat on. This is me with my, I go to football matches hat on, the same as every other football fan for every other club does. You score a goal. Like, in the heat, in the moment you celebrate. But instantly, the second the goal, like the second you finish celebrating, you look up, if they're not back in the center circle, you're going, oh, for fuck's sake, not again. Don't do it to me. And then you have a lack of information in the ground. You look up at screens, you've no replays half the time, and you'll see this fire check and possible offside, fire check and possible foul. You're going, you must be fucking joking me. Then it takes four minutes to figure out. Like if it takes four minutes, if it takes four minutes for the referee and, and the assistant referees, or whatever the fuck they want to call each other these is, to figure out was he or was he not interfering with play. Like, the likelihood is he wasn't. You're trying and to it wasn't clear and obvious, like they say. It takes four obvious. minutes. Like yeah. you're not, they're tr- it, it almost stinks like they're trying to find a way not to allow the goal. Because if it takes that long, they're looking for something. They're literally trying to find justification not to. And I've seen this for other clubs, and I've been pissed off seeing it for other clubs as well. It's not just United. It really fucking annoys me. Like, the one. As much as that annoys me, it also ruins that experience of celebrating a goal. I mean, it's the most, it's the most exhilarating, pure thing in football to be inside in the ground, whether in the home end or the away end, your team score, that instant rush of adrenaline and that fucking hugging and kissing the random fucker beside you that you've never spoke to or never will again and you're jumping up on top of someone and it's elation. It gets taken away from you. You're like, oh, why? Like the worst Arsenal away this year, like these scars will take a while to heal, but that Garnacho goal, for whatever reason it was, I think it was the fact that maybe we knew deep down that scalping Arsenal this early in the season after a bad start could really set us off and it could really get us going. It would be a big statement. And the, the way Tin Hag set the team out that day was the first time and probably the last time we really saw his new brand of football. It was about to work. Garnacho steals in, gets the goal. The away end went fucking mental. It was just sheer and utter ecstasy. And to think a minute or two later that was taken away and you're just going, I've just absolutely given every ounce of energy in my body celebrating that goal and I've been to the highest highs and brought back to the lowest lows. It's it's disgusting as a match going fan. I mean, it's not as bad within reason watching on telly at home because you're getting information and you're seeing what's happening. You're seeing the VR checks and not taken away from it, you know, but you're like, you are actually seeing what's happening. You kind of have half understanding of it. When you're in the ground there and then at the moment, it's, it's heartbreaking because you have no fucking clue what happened. You can't see a replay. You have no idea if it is or isn't, if it's justified or not justified. And you're waiting there for four minutes going, fucking come on. But you know deep down, if it's taking that long, it's going to get chalked off. If he goes to the monitor, it's going to get chalked off. It's it's horrific. The, the offside one, the one I, if I could change anything there, sorry to bleed on it, but if I could change anything on the VAR side of things. As I grew up as a kid many moons ago, we were always led to believe the offside rule was give the benefit of the doubt to the attacker. Football's about scoring goals. So give the benefit of the doubt to the attacker. If it's borderline, if it's close, you give the benefit of the doubt to the attacker. 
that was how we grew up. That's how we watched football. That's how it always was for years and years and years. It is now flip turned back to that player's left testicle was offside by one millimeter and the goal's chalked off. It, do, you know I mean? do you know what I mean? Like it's, got, it's become that fucking minimalistic and go back to giving the fucking benefit of the rule to the attacker. Make it that it has to be clear daylight between the defender and the attacker. I mean, if a fella's shoulders in front of the, of the defender, for fuck's sake, he's not actually getting a 10-yard advantage. He's fucking shoulders ahead of him. Like, tidy it up a bit. Now. I feel a bit of sympathy for the referees themselves because nah, fuck I em, find, fuck No, just hear me out on this because I find... I know, I'm not, not individually, but I find each season that we go along now with Varian, I find that it's getting worse. And I find that the power that the referee has is lessening to the point that they're all so reliant on this technology. So you've got a guy in the middle who's making the big calls, but really, it's not down to him. There'll be technology that will oversee his, his decision either way. And it, it's kind of getting to this the sake, well, what's the point in him? Will, how long will it be until we have a robot driving around the pitch as a referee with, with, with certain cameras? And another point I wanted to make too is, you know the goal line technology that they've got? If the ball passes the line, the referee gets a bing on the, on the witch or whatever, or on the watch. Why doesn't that carry on for the rest of the byline? Wouldn't that just make so much sense and of course it clar- cover up or fix a lot of fucking issues there's so many issues that could be at play i don't know that if they don't know themselves how to tackle it and i and i, I feel simply with the referees themselves because i think they're powerless they just look powerless they look like they're second guessing everything they every decision that they made there's no sense of support from the referee association like one thing that, that that's actually really got my, my grave this season is the referee association issuing apologies now one the reasons that it's annoying me is we've had so many decisions go against us we haven't got a whisper of an apology but that's not why i'm pissed off i just think it's petty it was never part of football and it's after creating this kind of um feeling at clubs that if things don't go their way we're starting to see these um childish statements come out these meaningless statements liverpool a few weeks ago asking for almost asking for a fucking replay. And this is all getting out of control, but it's from the, assault, the referee association issuing replays or issuing apologies and just the complete shit show of decisions every week. I think there was three or four over the weekend in the Premier League alone. It also opens up, and you mentioned Liverpool there a few weeks back. I mean, you can say I'm biased again, but it opens up where Klopp and Liverpool make such a massive deal out of it that they didn't appear to be getting decisions in their favour afterwards because, no, look, I'm just saying it looks that way. I'm not saying it is that way, but it looks like they've kicked up enough of a fuss and Klopp has had enough of a cry about it and Liverpool have made enough of a fucking bitch and big deal out of it that it looks like they're getting favourable results and there are favourable Fire decisions in their favour afterwards to try and make up for the fact that they did get shafted and won. I mean, it's a bit fucking stupid reading the whole lot of it. But what just, a, just re- on that, reason, or, on the, just one, interrupt on that because it's an important point. Do you not think, and I'm seeing United fans mention this, do you not think Ten Hag is missing a the trick there? Because Klopp is, is quite, yeah. quite clearly putting pressure on the referees. And this is something that both of us witnessed for many years with Sir Alex Ferguson. Ferguson. Yeah. He is, and I suppose like, we're probably on the flip side of, of this this season, whereas at the Wolves game, we got what was deemed to be a questionable decision for us. And it seems that we've suffered ever since. And we've got fucking shafted by every decision that's come up against us. So should Tin Hag maybe put his fucking nose out of joint with the referees and, and stick in them about it and try and reclaim some sort of normality? Yeah, probably. But like, is it really come to this? Is this what football has become? That you've got to hope to God that your manager can cause enough of a fuss with the referees that they're going to give you the decisions that they might or might not? But just to, just to go back on your point about referees, one of the reasons I don't feel sympathy from, to, to devil's advocate your point, I almost feel that they're being lazy in their decision making because they know they've got backup on the fucking VAR. Like I almost yeah, feel like they're, that's fair. I think they're pussying out. Of, like it's not, they're pussying out of the decisions, or they're kind of going, 
look, I'll call it this way, but fuck it, it doesn't really matter because I can get the VR to check it. And look, they, they'll cover my arse. If I got it wrong, got it wrong. It feels like they're pulling out a decision. It's like, pulling, it's like a, a midfielder or a defender pulling out of a tackle, knowing they've got someone covered them. It's the very same. It's like the referee's pulling out of a gun. I have two or three lads in a van around the corner. They're going to cover my arse here. So I think it's also created that for the referees where they don't have to be as decisive anymore. But I think the point, awesome. the, the, point, the point is making was they're weaker. Like, they are weaker, yeah. They're weaker so, in decision but, making. They're weaker in, in decisiveness, and they're weaker in, in how they affect the game. Do you know, it's it's silly. It's it's silly all around. It's it's fucking pissing a lot of people off, and it is ruining the game an awful lot. I can imagine the referees aren't too happy because there was reports a few weeks ago that apparently they were off having meetings in Saudi Arabia and and maybe hearing about some of the money that they could earn over there, or perhaps meeting with owners of um, Newcastle and. Yeah, you other Premier League clubs. To... <laughs> it, it, it begs the question, should, and it was a good question raised by someone on social media during the week, should English Premier League referees be moonlighting as Saudi Arabian fucking referees in their down, downtime? I mean, there is a bit of a conflict of interest, isn't there, with club ownerships and that? Going there you go. There. And the, you know? but Carragher made a really good point when this, not that he always makes a good point, but he made a good point when this story popped up that the referees are kind of flirting with the idea. I totally agree with him. Went along the lines of kind of saying, well, we look at the referee, the state of officiating in this country right now in England. It's not good. So if they want to go to Saudi Arabia, let them. Why can't the Premier League pay referees a little bit more money, go out to Spain, go out to Italy, and find the best referees and bring them to the best league? If the English referees want to play that game and not officiate play, in the yeah, best league, let them. Let them. And he, do you know what? He's not wrong. I mean, clubs go and seek the best players from the, from any other league they can find them. Why should it be any different for referee? And why should we not be going finding the next Pierre Luigi Colina or the likes of that? You know, go in and get the best referees, pay him fucking appropriately, bring him over. And if we claim to be the best league in the world, yeah, have the best officiating. But it's very difficult, very difficult to see the Premier League push his chest out and make these claims of being the toughest in the best league. When you're looking at fucking pathetic decision making by the referees every week, it's killing. Like it's killing. The one that really gets to me, and I know it doesn't really affect us directly, but when I see a club at the bottom side of the league, and they're hammering trying to stay up, and their fans have been trying to get up for a couple of years, and they're finally making it to the Premier League, next thing they're getting shafted out of. Let's say they get shafted out of three points. Them three points could be the difference between that club surviving in the Premier League or going back down to Championship. It could be the difference of their fans going to watch Premier League football next year or watching Championship football. It could be the difference of that club having the money to fucking keep going or not. I mean, this is the, the gravity of the situation at the lower end of the league. I mean, fair enough, we, we lose out in three points. It's not going to break us. It's not going to relegate us. But you're seeing clubs that are smaller stature and don't have the bank balance and the budget to keep going like that kind of stuff. And they're maybe, maybe even be kind of fighting above their weight. To see them getting fucking shafted by ludicrous decisions, it, it's, it's wrong, do you know? Harry Maguire started his sixth consecutive game in the 1-0 win over Fulham and was superb at the back yet again. Considering he wasn't wanted at the beginning of the season, what does this say about his attitude and professionalism at a time Ten Hag is having to deal with like a man-child like Jadon Sancho? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great comparison because Harry Maguire in the summer... Harry Maguire for the last year or two has been fucking hammered by the fans. And I can't say I wasn't guilty of it myself. Towards the end of last season, I can't say I wasn't. I was I was definitely in the camp of he needs to go, time's up. But to be fair, I always did say, as much as I said his form was gone, I always said, I think he for himself needs to go. I think he's his own, I'm talking about mental health, his own mental health, I thought he needed to get out of the club because it looked like his career with United was over. And he never really stepped a foot wrong. Like he never really acted the bollocks. I brought it up before on, on the podcast. He never acted the bollocks on social media and whatnot. Do you, know, do you know, actually, since we were talking about the United stand earlier on and talking about mental health, I think my, this is a very important point, as you mentioned there with Harry Maguire, because it was channels like that that would have they, jumped on his every mistake. They drove and, it. Yeah, yeah. They drove it, yeah. Like, that's exactly what we're saying. Like, he was, he was open season for the likes of fucking Mark Aldridge and Saeed and fucking Rance and all them other wankers. He was open season for them boys to, to hammer him, but he didn't do himself any favours with his performance on the field, to be fair. But like, Harry Maguire, as much as his form dropped off the planet and he may have said some questionable things in his own backing of himself, which I suppose, to be fair, 
you're entitled to back yourself. If you don't back yourself, who will? He didn't really do too much out of the way. He got stripped of the captaincy. He was linked to the move to West Ham. And as I said myself earlier, I, at the time, I would have piggybacked him down to the Olympic Stadium. I thought he should have left. He came back this season and he... I always got a sneaky feeling from Ten Hag, the way Ten Hag spoke about him. Ten Hag was always very positive about him when he was asked. It's always very much Harry's part of the squad. Harry wants to fight for his place. You know, he never really chucked Harry under the bus or never really said anything negative about him or kind of showed any feelings towards getting rid of him as such. Actually, to be honest with you, he, if anything, he showed quite the opposite. He kind of kind of backed Harry Maguire to stay in the squad and, and fight for his place, which is interesting. But Maguire stuck it out kept the head down, injuries afforded him a place back in the side again. And again, as I said earlier today, an uncomfortable truth. Harry Maguire has been one of our best players for the last while, although it's been a shit enough period. He's been a standout defender. He's been the best defender we've had in numerous games. Again, last week or last weekend, probably man of the match, arguably, against, against Fulham. All this while keeping the fucking head down and the mouth shut. In stark contrast, to Jaden Sancho, the star boy, fucking generational talent, who spat the dummy out, who literally, if he shut the fuck up and got on with it, there's no way he's not starting week in, week out for United. I mean, it's easy to save the crystal ball, like, but there's no way Jaden Sancho does not have that right wing position to himself right now if he fucking kept the mouth shut and the head down. But he decided to go the other route. He decided to go on social media and fucking nail the manager at a time when the manager didn't really need, really need any more nailing because he was after getting nailed to the cross enough times with club statements left, right and centre. We all know what's been going on. It just shows you the different type of mentality in a footballer. And it's funny, it's funny it comes from two English lads as well, two lads in the England camp and two lads that are English internationals. The stark contrast in two English players. Like, you know, if you were to look at like a, a generic type of English footballer, tough of mind, tough footballer, thick skinned, gets stuck in. But like for Sancho to show himself to be so fucking weak. And again, we've alluded to the fact maybe he just has such bad people around him and bad people advising him. Maybe it's yes men everywhere telling him he's the best footballer in the world and he should be playing for Real Madrid winning fucking Ballon d'Ors. I don't know. But it's it's an awful contract. Like Jaden Sancho must be, surely be the God sitting at home going, why didn't I just fucking shut up? Why didn't I just bide my time? Because at the moment, I'd probably start right wing over Anthony. So Jaden Sancho surely would. So it's it's a strange one. It's a it's a pity to see it's a pity to see Sancho burn his bridges so hard that he can't get back in the side. And there is no coming back from this. I'd be very surprised if he ever 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 sees the field for us again. I can't imagine he's not going to leave in January. But it is a, it's a very good depiction of what can happen at a football club. Football is fickle, as we've always said. If you keep the head down and you fucking take your chance when you get back into the side, who knows what happens? So give Harry Maguire his credit. Well done. After everything that's happened with Jaden Sancho, I'd I'd be appalled if he played for the club again. And I think if Eric Ten Hag was to give him another run out, another appearance, the writing would be on the wall for me as far as I'm concerned him being manager. Yeah, because... he can't he can't come back in, can he? I mean, there's no way the fans would accept it because it's, it's gone too long. The fact that he's literally said, I will not say sorry. Now, whether he's right or wrong, I mean, look, there's we can play the flip side to this. Has Ten Hag been too harsh on him? There's a, there's a discussion to be had there. There is definitely a, a discussion. Has Ten Hag snapped has he been overly aggressive in how he's dealt with him there's a, there's definitely an argument for it was what Jaden Sancho did that much of a crime that it couldn't be recovered but, possibly but, 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 I, but I, well, I, I'm back I backed in hey, don't get me wrong I'm just saying there is an argument to be had both sides of it but there are that are there is people are having that argument but I don't think it stands for me that he went too hard because again if you go back to what he said a manager has to have the power to be able to say this player has not pulled his weight this week. He never said he'd never play for United again. It was just that he was out of the team for that game. And it would have, I, I'm guessing, would have been in the team for the following week had he not put out that statement. It sounded more like a kick up the arse, kind of like trying to light a yeah. flame under his arse, wasn't it? It wasn't it like, it wasn't a, I wasn't that your career is dead. It was more of a kind, no. of a, a kind of a fucking motivational thing more than anything else, I think, in a backwards way. But, but, but I think it's so dangerous to have people like that in a dressing room for any manager to to survive or to exist because you've got to get rid of those players. Players have to understand that 
you will get a kick up in the arse from time to time. It, but there has to be like a mutual respect between two. It's just like anyone in a job, a manager going to try and get the best out of his employees. And some are really, really good at that. You read, you read stories about Alex Ferguson and we, we could spend the whole night talking about what players have said about him. But you'll also hear players, Roy Keane, that didn't like the way Ferguson dealt with him, especially towards the end of his career. So you're going to upset people. But what's pissed me off about this is there's people out there that are just siding with Sancho. Now, I don't get my head around it because Ten Hag hasn't done anything wrong in this case. Nothing, nothing wrong. Now, you can, you can say that you don't agree with Ten Hag, but that's rubbish because he's the manager. What do you mean you don't agree w- with what he said about what Sancho was like in training? The manager says a player is not carrying his weight in training. I'm not going to buy a player or buy what a player says if he just says, oh, that's not true. I'm going to buy the manager. Manager comes first. I said it last week about United that we will not be successful as a club until... The club and the board understand that Ten Hag or whoever's manager is number one. These players on these super contracts carrying the weight when they get upset, they get their camp and their friends, which is happening at United. There's a few players that are close to Sancho that I think I look at on the pitch and their body language still is appalling. I'm not going to name any, but people listening, you know who I'm talking about. It does, it, to be fair, we're backing up what we discussed on the last podcast because we did do a little bit of a segment on this where we did relate back to when Ferguson got rid of the likes of Beckham and Stam and, and Keane and him. And again, we've, we spoke about how Pep has done similar. You you want you want to have Tin Hag having that say. You'd like to think he has the full back of the club like we said last week. He doesn't, obviously, because the club is in a bit of a shit show. But I suppose on the flip side of two... It's easier. It was easier for Ferguson to do that and to have that kind of power because of what he'd proven and what he'd done and what he delivered. And likewise, Pep Pep has delivered over hand over fist for, for City as well. So he's obviously got that massive support and everyone's bought into him. Like Tim Hag is coming into a fucking circus. Like he's come into a circus. And granted, he had a good season last season and he steadied the ship and he won the Carabao. But like. He still doesn't have that like godfather fucking I've done everything and I've proven everything with the club kind of belief from people. Like you can see it in the last few weeks. People have been so quick and so ready to go. Yeah, I think his time is up. Like it, it, he's he's on the way out and all that. And in fairness, you can't you can't really blame him because we've seen this cycle of bullshit with managers for the last while. So that's probably by that probably plays a part too in the fact of his his power over the team and his power over the club. But Again, you'd like to think that he has the ultimate say, but it doesn't look like it. I don't think that's going to change unless what's above him changes, and that starts in the boardroom and the owners. But again, we can discuss this in every podcast until it eventually happens. I mean, you get blue in the face from talking about the fucking takeover and and Sir Jim Radcliffe and Qatar, and it just becomes a fucking humdrum, constant load of nonsense. So at the end of the day, I think think to be fair, at the end of the day, the two of us have openly back Tin Hag, support him, would prefer to see Tin Hag do well than any of the players get the power over him. And, and we're, we're too long in the tooth and we're too used to seeing these player powers and lads on these bumper contracts having to fucking, having to run the roost. So I really hope, I really hope over the next couple of weeks that Tin Hag does pull this out of the shit and starts getting a run of games and starts getting some results, gets a bit of morale back in the side again and just starts to get a bit of belief in himself from, from both, I suppose, both the club and the players and, and the fans alike. And starts to earn that trust back again that he can pull us around when things go to shit and he can turn things around and that he's here for the long term. And that's what we all want realistically at the end of it. Exactly. So before we move on from the game, I want to give a special mention to, of course, match winner Bruno Fernandez, who we backed last week when after Roy Keane was kind of saying we should strip him of captaincy. Stoppage time, leader stand up. Bruno was there with a winner and I hope he carries on that. It gives him the boost he needs. Another special mention too for Onana, who I thought was very good at Craven Cottage. Um, we mentioned Harry Maguire, who for me was man of the match. Uh, Scott, Scott McTominay played very well as well, just to say. Scott McTominay, yeah, he was unlucky not to score. But as well as that, afterwards he carried on his influence, which I think Harry, or sorry, Scott McTominay can be guilty of at times. He does something good in a game and then he can go hiding. That wasn't the case against Fulham, and I thought it was actually one of his better performances of the yeah. season. 
Um, but of course, Brian, looking forward to Copenhagen. You'll be setting off in the morning. Tell me how you're feeling about the game now that we got back to winning ways. A hell of a lot better than I thought I'd be feeling, to be honest, because I was I was dreading the Fulham game to see what would happen. But um, that win, especially a last minute ish win, like you're leaving a football ground, and one of the last things you've seen is a score late winner. So you're bouncing out of the ground, you're buoyant. I know you've gone through 90 odd minutes of shit, but funnily enough, that goal sometimes covers over that and, and gets you smiling. So a lot more positive going, really looking forward to it. It's, it was one of the trips of the three Euro ways we have, like Munich was fantastic, but obviously Munich being the first away and it was so close to the draw, it was extremely expensive. A lot of lads missed out on it and Oktoberfest was on and it was it was a bit of a fucking, bit of a rushed one to try and organise it. It was still a brilliant trip. But Copenhagen, like Galatasaray has its own iconic measures around it and, and a bit of animosity around it. But Copenhagen's a class one. Like it looks like an absolutely sensational city. Um a couple of us heading over in the morning. Really, really looking forward to this one. Uh we're flying from Dublin at ten o'clock in the morning. We're landing in Copenhagen. We're then taking a train. We're there the day before, so we have a day of fucking around to do. We're taking a train from Copenhagen to Malmo, which is only half an hour away in Sweden, across the sea. Really cool looking train. Uh, we're going to pop over there for a look around, a couple of drinks, bite to eat, come back to Copenhagen and, and fall into whatever bar that the Reds, the travelling Reds are in, get a bit of atmosphere going. And then the best part of travelling the day before you're away is you wake up in the city on the day of the match. You're not travelling and you're not rushing to get to the game and you're bollocks by the time it comes round. I've seen a couple of clips and videos online of Copenhagen's ultra section and their, their home fans Looks really good. Looks really, really, really good. I mean, typical of European grounds and European fans, they create a noise like their their three ends of their ground will be hopping. The atmosphere should be amazing. Which we've never won there. I've never won there. No, we're also um we're also not playing great football, so it's hard to know what to expect again. But you can only hope that that last minute winner gives us a bit of a push and gives us a bit of a lift, and 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 that the players come off the field thinking. Similar to we did, you know, a bit of confidence back. I mean, it's a must-win game. It's as simple as that. You can't, you can't not win. They have to know that going out there. So, same as we've been asking for all season, and same as we always ask for. And I've always said it: win, lose, or draw. All you want is effort. All you want to see is them come off the pitch afterwards, and know they fucking give everything they have. And if they if they do give everything they can, we're a better team than Copenhagen. Let's be realistic. We have a better side, a better squad. We should be winning this game if they fucking go out and give it. But. It's hard to know what will happen, but really looking forward to it, really excited for a trip to Copenhagen, my first time in Scandinavia, so I'm excited about that, and hopefully it should be a good crack, that most Euro ways are, to be fair. Absolutely. I think Ten Hag should just play the Europa League anthem in the dressing room before the players go out. <laughs> just put, the, put, the, put the fear into them. <laughs> 100%, 100%, yeah. If you, if you don't play well, you're going to get used to fucking listening to this again. If you don't play um, well, you're going to get knocked out by Sevilla again or, so, or fucking something similar. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it should be a crap. I really, really, I am really, really looking forward to it. It's one of the games of so far this season. It's one of the games I'm really fucking buzzing off going to. So it should be a cracker. Looking forward to it. I'm not one bit jealous. We have a range of questions to get through over the next 10 minutes or so before we wrap it up. So Shane has a question which is related to the game against Fulham so we'll go with that first <clears throat> even though Maguire and Evans were solid at the back yet again what are your thoughts on Varane being on the bench Varane on the bench is causing me questions and I'm going to go with the conspiracy theorist head of me in this one but I don't know is there something amiss in the background because if Ram is like the City game, I'm always of the opinion, if you're good enough to be on the bench or if you're fit enough to be on the bench, you're fit enough to play. Whether you only get 45 minutes open or not, he should have started. I thought he should have started. I thought Ten Hag got that wrong. Now, this is unless there isn't something weird going on in the background. Then he comes off the bench. I can't remember what time he came off the bench in the weekend, but it was late on. Like, you can't logistically start Johnny Evans, who came in to train with the side. I mean, if you think about it, it's quite funny. Johnny Evans came in to train with the side. Ten Hag looked at him and went, do you know what? He isn't fucking bad. He's he's all right, isn't he? He can fucking win a header and he can fucking stick in a tackle. Jesus, lads, hang on. Who's this cunt here? Evans. He was at the club before. 
Sign that fucker up there for a month. See what happens. No, sign him up for a year and we keep him. Why not? And all of a sudden, an aging Johnny Evans is keeping multiple Champions League winner Rafael, Rafael Varane out of the side. Doesn't that up? I know Varane has missed 36 or 7 or 8 games or something through injuries and signing. It's been a shit show. But if he's fit, you can't not play him. Like It's as simple as that. No harm to Johnny Evans. And Johnny Evans hasn't done himself any injustice at all when he's played for us since he came back to us. He must be fucking smiling to himself going, this is class. But unless there's something in the background, unless himself from Tin Hag have had words or unless there's something else at play, I can't see how he doesn't start. I can't see how he doesn't start any game that he's fit. Albeit Johnny Evans has done well. So came off the bench again the weekend. I'd expect Raphael Vrent to start on Wednesday night. Absolutely. I don't have the stats at the top of my head. Probably should. But if you looked at our clean sheets this season, I think you'd find that most of them came with Johnny Evans and Maguire at the back, which is interesting. But as well as that, I'd be wondering if Ten Hag has perhaps lost trust in Varane. Because you, you, can't, you can't get a run of games from him. One of our biggest problems with our defence is from one week to the other, it chops and changes. Maybe he feels that he can get the stability out of those two. But with tomorrow's tomorrow or Wednesday night's game against Copenhagen, maybe he's been keeping Fran for that. But if he's not in the starting lineup against Copenhagen, I think questions. some of the questions, yeah, there'll be some big yeah. questions asked for that one. Fabiola gets in another question. Should Ten Hag give Palestri a chance to start against Copenhagen given his work rate and performance in the last 15 minutes against Fulham? A very simple answer to this one. Yes, adamantly yes. I'd also start Victor Lindelof right midfield. I'd start Anthony Martial right midfield. I'd start Reggie on right midfield. I'd start anybody currently in the first team that's fit right midfield over Anthony because I really, really have been fucking annoyed by him. I've been so disappointed since he came back into the side. He's been horrifically bad. He really, really has. I mean, he needs to pull the finger out. At the end of the day, you have to earn your spot in the team. And he, it's true of every single player on the side. He has to be dropped. He hasn't been good enough. He's got to try and make his way back into the team. For me, he's got to try and earn his place back into the side, not keep his place. I mean, Pellistry came in the weekend and you can't say he didn't have a massive effect on the game to the point of almost saying he changed the game, to be fair. He's, he did nothing wrong. He has, to, he has to start. It's as simple as that. He has to start. He's, he's taken his chance when he came on off the bench. He's done what he can do in, in the cameo he got. What more can you do? Manager gives you 15, 20 minutes. You play well. You do everything you can. I can't understand how you can justify starting Anthony. He's been fucking toilet for weeks. The only reason I can see he's getting into the team, and it's not a good enough one, is defensive contribution. Because he offers absolutely nothing going forward. Zero M product. Like, really, really bad. But then, then you have the, the opposite with Palestri, that when he started games this season... It's like he's almost kind of at the same stage as Garnacho. Garnacho, yeah. That yeah he's not, not, not quite. That's fine. They're young players. And this is the problem that you have with a squad when you're so reliant on players that aren't quite what they need to be. Um, so, yeah, I, I would. I'd still risk him. I'd still risk him. I still yeah. fucking, I would. I'd risk him. I know you're. That's true. Yeah. I know what, yeah. I know what you're saying. It's, it's, so, bad. it's so bad. You have to risk him, I think. It is. It is so bad. I mean, you. how can Ten Hag honestly look Pellistry in the, in the face and say you're not starting this game after you were absolutely brilliant when you come off the bench last week and Anthony has been fucking terrible I mean like, like my point says Anthony needs to earn his way back into the side I mean he he has to be dropped and he has to earn his way back in by coming off the bench and doing what Pellistry did so Pellistry has every right to, to be putting in a shout for that, that right, right midfield spot yeah? and I'd be very disappointed if he doesn't start Just before I get on to the next question I want a little bit irrelevant because it's Bruno Fernandes I'm talking about but we were talking briefly about the lack of service that Ra- Hayden is getting from the left-hand side and the no service he's getting from the right-hand side. But on that right-hand side, we've seen Bruno Fernandes play there quite a bit. And when you think of Bruno, Bruno's a more creative player in the squad. He's the one that pulls the strings to the final third, but should be. Hasn't been happening for him this season. <clears throat> but I look at Hyland, he has to start picking him out a lot more. There's been one or two games this season where there's been no pass to Highland at all. He hasn't got one through to him. And, and that's really, really poor. But what it reminded me of was Van Persie did a segment with BT Sport a few seasons ago where he spoke about when he came to United and there was a game during the first games of the season where 
Carrick and Scholes in midfield failed to pick out Van Persie once. I've heard this and before, yeah. Ferguson was completely livid about it. So the next game, he started Carrick and started Scholes in midfield, but warned them beforehand, if you don't find Van Persie, you're not playing the next game. It was just straight at that. I actually think it was at half time during the game. They was it half time? I think so. I think thinking back to this one, I think at half time when they came in, they hadn't been finding Van Persie, and he no. literally looked at him and goes, "You get the ball to Robin Van Persie, or you don't play." I mean, you can't, be any, yeah. you can't be any clearer than that. I talked about this to someone recently again, and I was talking. Funnily enough, something the last week or two, I brought this point up with someone, and they tried to say, "Oh well, look, you're you're dictating to a player that you have to do this and you have to do that." Yeah, like you've got a striker there who's mm-hmm. your main man who's feeding that fuck all. Give him the fucking ball. Play to his strengths. There's, there's no point in us spunking a load of money on Rasmus Highland, putting all the pressure in the world on a kid's shoulders, chucking him into the side. I mean, again, I made the point in the summer when he signed, he must have a massive pair of balls to take on the job of being United's main striker at his age. The least you can expect from his teammates is to fucking play at his strengths and give him some supply and give him a chance. Give the kid some bit of a chance of scoring goals. Because the longer this goes on, I mean, he's got no domestic goals so far. He's got a couple of European goals. He has no domestic goal score for United. It doesn't look very well on him. And I'm sure he's sitting there at home thinking to himself, this is fucking bad. Like, this doesn't look great. Well, you could see it at Craven Cottage on Saturday when he came off. He wasn't yeah. It was the first time where he showed that he was, he was getting to maybe a little bit. Which is, look... Hopefully it clicks for him. I, I I certainly wouldn't be worried about him because what I have. No, seen, he looks he looks very good. There. He really looks good. he looks really good. He just hasn't yeah, been getting supply, but his work rate, like his his tenacity dropping deep. I love to see it because you could you could forgive a striker if they weren't getting service. You could forgive a striker for dropping the shoulders and going fuck this. I can't be asked. But he's not like he's just. It's like he's turning around going, well fuck you. If you're not going to give me the ball, I come and get it. And he's mm. dropping deep and he's showing himself like one of the things he's doing, which we've missed for a long time. And I love it. Outside of Vote Veghurst, who, well, let's not get into my opinions of Vote Veghurst. Mm. It, it was the only thing in football he was actually able to do. He drops deep, he comes in front of his defender and he offers an out ball into his chest or into his feet. He's got the strength to hold off the defender and he's well able to link someone in with him, which is a massive thing we were missing because. More often than not, that ball wasn't Anthony Martial. He's fucking three yards behind the defender, making daisy chains on the fucking ground, sitting on his arse, or he's too busy <laughs> looking into the crowd or fucking sulking about something or something's gone on with him. So, like, we've missed that. I love it from him. I really do love it from him. I wanted to, I want to see a click for him. I want to see him start scoring goals and getting some confidence up because I re- for it's funny, for a striker that hasn't been scoring goals, I'm fucking mad about him. So I hope things turn around for him quite soon because he looks like a very, very capable and very energetic and strong striker that I think if we feed him and play at his strengths, he'd bang him in for us. James asks, with United six points behind Arsenal and Liverpool, who are both supposedly in a title race, are we really having that bad of a season or are things being blown out of proportion? If, if you ignore the six points behind Arsenal and Spurs and that, if you look at our season basically just on our season, yeah, it's been fucking shit. It has been terrible. You can't paper over any of that. It's been poor performance and shit results. But if you try and put your positive slant in it, for want of a better term, and you do look at what's around you, we're not that far off top four for having a really shit season so far. It's funny, like, there's, the points differences aren't as big as you'd imagine. Like, if someone didn't tell you anything about the rest of the league or how anyone else was playing and told you just specifically about United's season, you'd think you were fucked. You'd think you were absolutely goosed. But, like... You're just after showing me the Spurs and Chelsea's result. Is it finished? Is that? Yeah, it's over 4 1 Chelsea. Jesus Christ, above in heaven. Um, yeah, funnily enough, like everyone is frotting about Spurs all season. I think tonight, just before we came on this, Romero got sent off for what possibly was a second red card, possible second red card defense. Far and, and referees fucking up again. Um, Madison is injured, I think. Has he done his hamstring? He's gone. They're after getting yeah, him off anyway. But if you, if you yeah. look at the table, right? Like looking at some results even this weekend, a lot of results went their way. You had Villa dropping mm-hmm. points, you had Liverpool dropping points, I think Brighton dropped points too. And there was well Spurs. I think what this point or what James's question gets that United have started the season appallingly. 
But I think it also shows the competition of the Premier League this season. It's a lot is tighter. It, it's a lot tighter than you yeah. think. Lot, lot lot the funny thing about it, to, to answer James's question, what it does highlight is it's recoverable. It's only a couple of results away from changing things around again. I mean, Ten Hag gets a run of goals, a run of, sorry, not a run of goals, a run of games, a run of wins under his belt in the league. Leave out Everton, it's cups and whatnot. He starts getting a run of three, four, five, six results in the league. And a couple of teams around us drop a few points. All of a sudden, you're back in top four, which isn't unthinkable at all in, a couple, in the space of a couple of weeks. As tight as this league is and as the results go, I mean, Chelsea have been fucking shit. Chelsea were diabolical last season. Hit and miss again this season below us in the league, having a terrible start to the season. Playing Spurs tonight, and to be fair, the hatred Chelsea have for Spurs, and obviously likewise Spurs and Chelsea, you always fancy Chelsea to get up for it, even if they're playing bad. French Postacoglu to get battered 4 1. Spurs were at home tonight, were they? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Jeez. To get battered at home 4 1 against their bitter rivals in Chelsea. I think th- he made uh, he made a comment during the week, which I found him. Again, he endears me. I like him as much as I don't want to. He made a comment the other day about their home ground, which is a class ground. I've been there the last two seasons for our away games. Most teams are trying to create a fortress at home. We've created a nightclub, and I'm okay with that. So you see after the game, they play music, and the fans are fucking literally dancing like they're inside the nightclub. The players are bouncing off it. Fair fucks to them. They're having a great time. But I don't think the nightclub is going to be open tonight after getting battered 4-1 off <laughs> Chelsea with three late goals. James Madison, I think, doing his hamstring, and Romero getting sent off. Where's your fucking nightclub now, Ange? Huh? It won't be, it won't be open we, tonight. <laughs> it won't be open tonight, buddy. So... You could see this little Spurs loving. I mean, even Gary Neville threw a dig at some ch- uh, Arsenal fan earlier today on Twitter where they were saying, we own we own the rights to who can come into our stadium. And yeah, bang should, Gary Neville and Carragher yeah, can comment it. And we, <laughs> we should decide they shouldn't come. They shouldn't be allowed in because we're entitled to ban who we want from the stadium. And <laughs> Neville threw a dig going, well, considering where Spurs are and Arsenal are at the moment, we'll be going to a lot more Spurs games and Arsenal games. Might not be right there now, Gary, after tonight, so... We could see Spurs becoming Spurs again, and this one could really knock the stuffing out of them. So again, it's another club that could start falling down, dropping points, opens the door for us to start climbing again. So it's the league, the season is far from over. It's a it's a league that is really, really tight. I mean, it's funny that so many sides, I mean, you were even mentioning sides a minute ago about dropping points. You mentioned Brighton. Go back 10 years ago, go back however many years ago. It would be unheard of to even be including the word Brighton in that conversation. It just shows how fucking tight this league is. And you know so many clubs coming up? Do you know what I mean? I mean, it is like Newcastle are back on form with their sports washing owners. Brighton are up around there. You've got clubs popping in and out of the top five, six, seven, eight. It's it's wide open for us to come back. And tonight gets a couple of results. We're, we're back well in the mix again for top four. Well, even after tonight's result, Chelsea are just three points behind us. So we have to look over our shoulder as well. Oh, not at all, not at all, not at all. We're, we're, we're grand. Don't mind them. Fucking the, the only way is up. The only way is up. Dave asks, and it's a bit of a premature question because we don't really know the finer details. And we mentioned this before, but do we trust Sir Jim Radcliffe? Okay. Do I trust Sir Jim Radcliffe? Funny one. I was listening to the United We Stand podcast today when I was driving and they made reference to Sir Jim Radcliffe and where this money is coming from that he's putting into the club. Now, it's the first time I've heard proper discussion about it, but from what the boys were saying on that podcast, the trust isn't really there in him. Bit of a charlatan. Hasn't been to Old Trafford for games. Lives overseas. blah de blah blah There's a lot of questions about Jim Radcliffe. I know we're I know we're absolutely screaming for a new owner, but in the summertime, you asked me in the summertime, or someone asked me, I don't know, Sean or someone, what my preference between the two, or it was came, it came up in a topic of conversation. And I said, and I think it echoes the feelings of an awful lot of United fans. If you were to ask us, or me, who my perfect owner would be, it doesn't exist. Because you want, the perfect owner is a red true and true absolutely fucking loaded who can come in clear the debt and allow the club to function as a football club first and foremost not a plc who can come in and let the club stand at its own two feet and i've always said it and so many have said it this club financially 
is a superpower. We don't need the billions behind us. We're well capable of, gener of generating our own money. Um, if, if Ed Woodward can be hat tip for anything he's ever done, as much as I don't like the fella, his commercial side, if Ed Woodward had been just solely working on commercialism, on commercial projects and advertising projects and had nothing to do with football, he would be the best in his job in the world. We have fucking noodle sponsors. We have tire sponsors. We have red wine sponsors. The man brought money in from every fucking corner of the globe. I'm surprised he wasn't selling sand in the desert. It's Man United sand. He was fucking phenomenal at it. He was just a shit show at the football side of it. The money United can generate, our global brand, the fact that we've reached all over the world is phenomenal. So we don't need that backing. We just need someone to come in and say, this is a football club first and foremost. So look, if you ask me who my perfect buyer was, red through and through, loads of money, football orientated, hire the best in class for the likes of John Murtagh and Richard Arnold's jobs. You hire the best in class. You put the right people in the right places. Unfortunately, we didn't get that. We were left with two options. Well, three, if you take that, I don't know, the Norwegian or Swedish fellow who just wanted to get his name in the papers. We had two, two options. One was Qatar, which most of us didn't really want due to the animosity around it and the sports washing side of it and whatnot. And the other one is Jim Radcliffe, who was possibly deemed as the lesser of two evils. But again, Jim Radcliffe is fucking nowhere near the ideal outcome. He really isn't. He's a 25% purchase wants to get control of the football side but where's the money coming from how much is he putting in there's questions there's a load of questions about there's it a lot there's of a lot doubt of, around it. there's a lot of doubt around it yeah i mean it's not it's not the fairy tale ending that everyone wanted it's not the solution that everyone wanted it is what it is and to be fair as i've said from the start is we can't really do fuck all about it we can cry and we can we can protest we can try our best to put pressure on At the end of the day them fucking weirdos in america it's up to them. When they decide to sell, they decide to sell. How much they decide to sell, they decide to sell. We're at the mercy of these fucking borderline terrorists in football. So mm. it's not... I don't know about Jim Ratcliffe. I can only... The only way I can say about Jim Ratcliffe is I hope, much like most of us, I hope it works out. I hope it's a good outcome. I hope his investment is, is positive. I hope it comes with some good ideas behind it. I hope his influence, whatever that influence may be, works in our favour whether it will or not remains to be seen, but I, I just don't know. It's just, it's not an ideal outcome for anyone, but it's all we have left. And if it's 25% less of the Glazers, it's 25% closer to freedom from them cunts. So, so be it. You heard it there first. I think that was like the biggest tip for Michael Knight in the hard jet. Well, he won't be successful, Brian. So you'll have to no, dream on about that one. Will we have, will we have Sir Jim doing keepy uppies in the halfway line? I wonder. If we have Michael Knight and we have UFOs and the whole lot of those, that, you know. <laughs> Matt, Matt Letizia is football and director. There you go. Pleasure as always, Brian. And thankfully, podcast after a win. Hopefully, it's the same in Copenhagen. I'm wishing you safe travels. I wish I was there. And a special thank you as well to the people listening to the podcast every week and those submitting questions. I'm going to give another mention, like I did last week, to ask you to give us a five-star rating on your Spotify or Apple podcast app. That goes a long way to getting the podcast out to a larger audience, so it's appreciated. Until later on this week, when we'll be previewing Luton and reviewing Copenhagen, look after yourself, and we'll speak to you again soon. Take care.